And once again, I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Buffalo History Channel. My name is Doug Ruffin, the content curator. So glad to have you all with us. I have a very special interview today. And this is I'm this is actually a an honor to have this gentleman on the platform today. Um in the field of black scholarship, I mean, his name is synonymous. He is one of he is among the giants in that world. Uh, he's also spent some he he spent some time. Many of you will be interested to know. For those that don't know, he spent a great deal of time in the city of Buffalo early in his career, and he was instrumental in the Juneteenth festival. He, he's instrumental in the Kwanzaa celebrations that take place in Buffalo. We're going to talk about that and much, much more. It is my honor to have the one and only. Malifi Kite Asante. Welcome to the Buffalo History Channel, sir. Wow, thank you so much, Brother Doug. I'm so happy to see you and see you following in the tradition of your great father, man. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be on this program. Thank you very much. It's a, it is wonderful to have you here. Uh, let's, I'd like to always start from the beginning. Um, you, you've been in the educational field many times for many, many years. Yes. Uh, yes. You talk to us about your educational background and what got well, you into my, my, it. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Good place to start. I was born in Georgia. I was born in Valdosta, Georgia, and uh, I actually migrated uh, to in, in school to Tennessee. Finished high school in Tennessee. Marched with Diane Nash when she led the Fisk University and the high school students in Nashville against segregated uh, business establishments. Uh, my senior year, I marched with with her. Uh, I went to um, a college in uh, Texas and Oklahoma and then finished my PhD at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. And after finishing UCLA, the first job I got was at uh, Purdue. I taught there for a year, didn't like it, went back to UCLA, mm -hmm. taught there for three years, and then I was hired to Buffalo. And so I went on to Buffalo from Los Angeles in 1973. Okay. So that's, that's the, in a nutshell, that's my background. Uh, my field of study, mm -hmm. I had two fields of study at UCLA. One was in uh, communication, and the other one was actually in history. So it's those two fields that have really uh, helped me, uh, even in the work that I've done in Black studies. So actually, uh, uh, I went to Buffalo to be the head of the Department of Communication uh, at uh, the State University of New York at Buffalo. And I, I went there and uh, I was um, one of the youngest full professors ever in the SUNY system. Uh, I think I was 31 years old. They made me a full professor and I chaired the Department of Communication uh, there for a while. And uh, then I moved from Buffalo uh, to um, uh, Philadelphia, to Temple University. Now, I had all, I'd been several places in between, Howard mm -hmm. University for a semester or two, uh, Florida State, uh, I worked in Zimbabwe uh, for a year. So I did, did several things, uh, but ultimately uh, landed in Philadelphia. Okay, so um, when while while you were at at, at college in Buffalo, at the colleges in Buffalo, you be at Buffalo. Uh, yeah. You got involved with the uh, black movement in Buffalo. Talk to us about yes, what the climate did. was of the black movement in Buffalo at that time. Well, bu bu Buffalo was exciting. Buffalo was creative. Uh, Buffalo uh, had uh, pound for pound for its uh, population an incredible amount of conscious people. And that was, uh, I, I don't know whether it was a surprise to me a, as much as it was something that was very beautiful because being in Buffalo, number one, uh, there, there had been a professor, uh, not a professor, a student in Buffalo who became very, very famous around the uh, world in terms of Pan-Africanism. His name was Chen Weizu. And, and Chen Weizu had written a book called The West and the Rest of Us. I didn't even meet him when he, when he was there. I came after Chen Weizu. But a lot of, lot of great professors uh, and students 
were at Buffalo. And then in the city itself, the city was dynamic enough that you had uh, you had Frank Masai, who was the leader of the NAACP. You had Doug Ruffin uh, and others who worked with uh, various community groups. You had um, uh, many, uh, a couple of community organizations. You had the Center for Positive Thought. Uh, the the You had the African American and African Museum. Uh, uh, you, you had uh, Kariamu uh, uh, Welsh and uh, her uh, Black Dance Workshop. Uh, you also had people on the radio and people um, who uh, were actually engaged in, uh, in the movement nationally and internationally who were in Buffalo and people came to Buffalo. Part of it was the history of Buffalo as being the, the port at which the Niagara movement started in 1905 when Du Bois and the other people came to Buffalo and went over to Fort Erie and helped to create the Niagara movement, which out of that came the NAACP oh. and so on. So Buffalo has a had a history and its history was rich and deep uh, with uh, people uh, coming through there and going to Ontario um, and so on. And that had been, a, uh, I mean, Mary Shad went through there. I mean, um, uh, John Brown went through there, the, the great white guy who was really fighting for black people. Um, Harriet Tubman went through Buffalo. So it was, it, Buffalo has, has a, has a, there is a, a symbolic nature to the culture of Buffalo. And then you had great music and jazz musicians and um, you know, I mean, um, I was there during the uh, the Rick James era. Yes, uh, there was also you had uh, the blues clubs and um, a couple of really nice uh, spa spaces where Grover uh, Washington came down and uh, you know and did his thing. So, so it, it was a to me it was a world of excitement uh, to be in Buffalo because people had ideas, they had thoughts. And not only that, but the intellectual uh, community in Buffalo was one that was it, it had a pan-African vision. And, and, and so, so my thinking, and I always tell people, people say, well, how did you come up with Afrocentricity? I, I, I mean, Buffalo can get, in, with the winters were long. That's one of the reasons that I, I escaped to Philadelphia. The winters were long. <laughs> but you know what? We're, what you know what? Most some of my most creative time was in Buffalo because those long winters sitting in the house around the fireplace looking at the snowfall, I thought a lot of stuff. And then I went going out to Elmwood Avenue or what one of those avenues, can't remember this the street now. What do you say? Uh, tea, tea, tea shops and coffee shops, and mm. sitting there and reflecting on the state of African Americans and the state of the world is where I came up with the idea that one of our fundamental issues as African people was that we never centered uh, our thinking from our own point of view. We looked at ourselves as others looked at us without saying, what, what do we think? Where, wh well, how do we see it? What's our, our, what's the way, what's our perspective on these concepts, whatever they are, uh, uh, character, beauty, love, relationships, family, economics, what do black people think on their own without anybody else? And that's where Afrocentricity comes from. Okay, Buffalo. speaking speaking of Afrocentricity in Buffalo, uh, there's two things I want to talk about. The first thing I want to talk about, of course, I just showed it to you off camera. This right here, Juneteenth, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Malif, for all our viewers that don't know, Dr. Malife Asante was one of the founders of the very first Juneteenth, Buffalo Juneteenth, that took place on Jefferson Avenue. Of course, you see the picture of my dad, Absolutely. my dad here, Absolutely. and uh, he, my dad was a part of that. Could you could you share with us what what your role well in when, in that was? Well, you know what I I come to when I start thinking about it because you know I had just got to Buffalo three years earlier, 
uh, when that uh, that Juneteenth happened in '76, and when I got to Buffalo, what I discovered is the Buffalo had a lot of people who had come from other places, and we had people who had come from Texas, and um, and the Texas connection was one of the uh, connections that uh, really I think helped to spur this Juneteenth movement. And because the black people in Texas, as you know, had uh, were the ones, the first ones to experience this notion of the Juneteenth the celebration. Mm -hmm. And so that had spread and it had spread. And, and I knew about it because I had gone to school in Texas. So that's when I got to Buffalo. I had I'd gone to Southwestern Christian College in Terrell, Texas. So I knew a little bit about Juneteenth. So Juneteenth was therefore very exciting to me. And then we had in Buffalo uh, this uh, coterie of people, uh, including your father and other people, who were who believed that it was essential that we have an African-American community that was connected to its history. And Build that, organization. That, yes, yeah, you, boy, you, you know some stuff. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so and and that by the way, Bill and that organization was in many ways uh, similar to or related to an organization that was in the sister city of Rochester that was called Fight. That yes. organization, Fight was an organization in Rochester that Franklin Florence was had been lead up. So so there were these things. So out of that, uh, this it was very easy for me to be a part of the 1976 Juneteenth celebration in Buffalo, New York. What are, you, that, yeah. what are some of your memories of that, of that day that you, you know, on, on Jefferson Avenue? You know, you know, the thing that I, I think I remember most is the, uh, and, and, and really this is taking a, a personal um, um, reference is the, the dancing, the African dancing. Uh, and I say taking a perfect personal reference because later on uh, in uh, 1981, uh, Kariamu uh, Welch and I married. So yes. the, the Black Dance Workshop being actively engaged in that. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, my sister had also lived in Buffalo. It was a very interesting thing. <laughs> she was not living there when I was living there. She had moved on to New York City, but but my sister had come up from the South and lived in Buffalo, and then she moved into um, uh, uh, to New York City. But but the beautiful thing about Buffalo was that we always seemed to have had enough people, whether they were uh, people who were engaged in filmmaking or who was uh, engaged in the uh, uh, the the industry of. Uh, of, of art, uh, you know, people like uh, Ed Smith and, and Jim Pappas, uh, all those people were also engaged in building this whole community of conscious people. And I was very happy to be a small part of it. And we, you mentioned earlier the Black Dance Workshop, and of course you, you were later married to uh, Carrie, Amu, Carrie Amu Welsh, who was one of the key players in the organization of that right. of the Black Dance Workshop. Uh, you also participated with when they started a, a building called had a building called the Center for Positive Thought, which Absolutely. also included a museum of African and African American history. Can you talk a to us about that? Absolutely, absolutely. I can I can tell you a little bit about that. I, I because uh, the the uh, Black Dance Workshop existed. Uh, the Black Dance Workshop existed before. Uh, the Center for Positive Thought. Mm -hmm. And the Black Dance uh, Workshop existed before the museum. All of that. Uh, but Kariamu's idea was that after going to Chicago and seeing that uh, 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 Haki Madhubuti uh, and Safisha Madhubuti had something that they called the Institute for Positive Education, that uh, perhaps uh, Buffalo needed to have something that would be educational for the community. And so that's how we began to develop the Center for Positive Thought, out of the idea of what can we contribute to the community. In fact, it's an idea that I still carry forward now, because in Philadelphia, I have the Maleficati Asante Institute for Afrocentric Studies, 
and we have lectures and uh, we stream our lectures uh, on uh, on Sundays at four o'clock uh, all over the world. So it's it's the, it's the same sort of idea that Kariamu and I had. How do we educate? How do we take what we know and like and like you're doing actually with the history uh, program? How, how do we just educate people? And right. so that's how it came. And so the center for positive thought was not just to be about. Uh, we didn't want to start a school. We wanted to start a place where people can give lectures. In fact, boy, very interestingly, one of the first lectures that was given at the Center for Positive Thought was uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, and that was when he was out of. Um, that was when he was out of uh, any kind of power. And uh, and uh, I remember going to get him. I don't think, I think that may have been in 75 or 70. I can't remember the exact date, but to pick him up from the airport. And uh, as I was going, I heard the news that uh, Reagan had been shot. So I, yeah. I, so I picked him up. I said, I said to Minister Farrakhan, I said, you know, um, did you hear the news? The president has been shot. And I remember his response always. He said, is he dead? <laughs> and, I, and I said, no, I don't know whether he's dead or not. I just know he's been shot. Yeah. And we and we went and he, he bought us a, a shirt because he, he needed a, a, a shirt, bought him a, a, a white shirt. And he went and he spoke at the Center for Positive Thought. So he was one of our first speakers. One of our, and, and, and he wasn't, it wasn't like he was he, who he is now. I mean, he was he was just a regular guy trying to you know get get back into the fold of and the swing of things. And so uh, that's that's when we um, that's when the center started, and and the center was uh, decided to also have the Institute of African American Culture and and museum because. Uh, we were both collectors of African art. I collected uh, tons of African sculptures and paintings, and she did the same thing. And so we said, "Why well, put all this stuff in the house? Let's just create a space at the at the building for it." And so we created that. And we were really fortunate to be able to meet the great Sheikh Anta Dia, who was the Senegalese uh, uh, scholar who wrote the book, uh, The uh, African Origin of Civilization. And we were able to share with him uh, the book that we had written describing what was going on in Buffalo in the museum. And one of my one of my memories of going to that museum as a child was we, we would go there on field trips a lot. Yes. And, uh, yes. When the one thing, the one of the the biggest exhibit that stood out to me was, I, I remember telling this to Gail and Yvonne and, mm -hmm. and Francis when I interviewed them, that mm -hmm. there was this, this huge statue. Because we were little kids at the time. Yes. This this huge statue now, which we which I know today from looking at the films, as it's called the Baganimba. Yes, sir. And we, we would I look up at this. Thing. We would look up. You still have that? I still have that. That thing I was humongous, man. The Baga is, is and it, you know, the Baga is the biggest type of mask worn in Africa, because it's a, it's a, it's one solid piece of wood, and it's worn on the dancer's head, the male yeah. dancer's head. And, well, they get and, and, there'd be some big dudes out there to do and, that. And they're strong dudes, <laughs> very, very powerful. You can hardly pick the thing up; it's heavy. So, so yeah, the Baga number. You remember that? Oh yeah! When I saw it on the on the film, I, that that jumped out at me immediately. <laughs> oh man, that's great! I mean, this is, I have to tell my son that he loved that story. Yeah, that's, yeah. So no, all all is good, and we're we're moving forward. I, my my one hundred and and first book just came out. Okay, because uh, uh, I've been writing since uh, Buffalo Days, uh, uh, African American history, African history. Okay. And my uh, my uh, my new book, uh, African American, or rather African history, uh, will come out in, in February. It's the fourth edition. Of okay. The okay. Now I was gonna. Of course, I was gonna ask you another event that took another 
one of those significant events that took place in the Center for Positive Thought is something that goes on today, Kwanzaa. And I yes. know you were involved in Kwanzaa in Buffalo. Can Absolutely. you talk to us about your involvement in the Buffalo yeah. Kwanzaas? Yes, of course. Kwanzaa, to me, was, was a very uh, special holiday. And uh, be, because I understood not only the principles of Kwanzaa, but the need for the reconstruction of cultural values. And that's the same thing that the uh, the great uh, philosopher, uh, Maulana Karengo, who founded Kwanzaa, that's what he understood. And I, I think that uh, we don't give each other enough credit, but he, this guy was 26 years old when he came up with the idea that one of the things that we need to look around and see is that everybody else celebrate themselves. They have holidays to celebrate th themselves. And we, we didn't have um, a celebratory uh, holiday. And uh, he, he, he created this holiday based on our cultural values. And what he did was to see what were the best values in our society. We know, for example, just take any one of them, like Kush Jakalia, which is self-determination. We know black people are self-determining and we know that we are very strong. And we know that if you fight against us, you got to fight on your hand. So self-determination, he said, that's a value. He looked at Umoja, a unity. He said, we always talk about we ought to be united and we ought to be, so he made that a value. He took all the things that he saw that, were, that, that we were doing but that were missing, we didn't have a name for them. And he named our behavior. He named, one of the things I sometimes think that he missed, and I, I need to call him up and tell him this, and he'll laugh about it because he's a comedian too in some way. People don't know that, he's funny. He's a real funny guy. I say, man, the one thing you didn't put in there was laughter. Somehow, really? African-Americans, we, we are people of laughter. You see mm -hmm. and. And, and there is a, a, a joyousness to it. And, and, um, and I say that because I've celebrated Kwanzaa all over the world in Johannesburg and Paris. I've celebrated Kwanzaa in Los Angeles with Dr. Karenga and his group. Uh, and, um, and, and when I celebrate it there, I always know that it's where they founded it. And he is always, and, and one of the things he used to do in the past he always tell some jokes. That was his thing because people never, they always think of him as serious, but he always told these jokes and had everybody cracking up. So this thing of Kwanzaa is a family holiday and it should be passed on from generation to generation, just like any other holiday. There's no reason why we cannot honor and respect the uh, our own ancestors and love our ancestors, appreciate what they do. When when uh, children get together, the names of those who are going on, um, particularly if they inspire us, ought to be seen as ancestors that we can respect and we can pass that on to our children. That's what, what was created with Kwanzaa. And Buffalo used to have Kwanzaa all the time in many different places. Uh, people would have it in their homes. Some of the schools they had, um, I think it was called the Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes. See, we, it was originally called the Center for Langston Hughes Center for the Visual and Performing Arts, and they changed it to Langston yeah. Hughes Institute. That's right. They used to have things. So there are many play, many parts to Buffalo. Yes. Uh, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, people were trying to do their own things. And to, right. and, and to practice this culture uh, because it's a beautiful culture. In fact, one of the interesting things is having brother just now as you are on the line with me, uh, this is very incredible. Brother yeah. from Nigeria that I mentioned to you, who um, uh, <laughs> this is, I don't know how this happened. This brother I, who have not, we haven't heard from from years, this brother, uh, has just given me a ring, and he is the guy I told you about. Um, and I am very, I, I just really, I just, I just want to see if he's, I, I, it'd be great to put him on, on the line. That's Chen okay. Wei. Chen okay. Wei, just call me. 
So this is that's that's really incredible. So I I I I don't know. Uh, wow, that is really. I I mean, yeah. So so <laughs> he said, um, yeah. Okay, okay, right. Anyway, so he's talking mm-hmm. about he's talking about the Palestine and Israel. Oh yeah, yeah. He just sent me a note, but anyway, I'm so. But but it's wonderful. I'll call him, call him, and tell him I really appreciate the fact that he called me while I was talking to people from Buffalo. Yeah, looking at when I'm thinking about your work, right before I was doing an interview with you, I was thinking about your work in Afrocentricity and throughout the years, and and you know I can remember my days of you know mm-hmm. starting to slowly get into it mm-hmm. myself when I was coming up through college and becoming familiar with the work of of Dr. Ben and yes. uh, Ivan Van Sertema yes. and the like. And then and yes. I, I think with more younger people today, with the newer generations, you have have more modern ways of communicating that yes. with, I mean, I think the most, the biggest thing that comes to mind was the Hidden Color series of the yes. 2010s. Yes. Yes. That, that got a lot of, got, that sparked the interest of a lot of younger Absolutely. people. How do you think Absolutely. that that's progressed over the years? Yeah, well, I mean, what in terms of the science or what? Yeah, the science and the awareness of Afrocentricity. Well, well, well I think that what's happening and it, it, it's very powerful is that um, we are we have we have uh, risen to the point where we are the men and women that our ancestors wished for. We we are what they have. This we are what they wanted. They wanted strong men and strong women. They wanted us to come forth and they wanted us to be able to uh, do things that they could not do. And so this is what I saw. When I saw uh, Hidden Colors, for example, I mean, we always knew we were smart and we were intelligent and we always knew we could be silent. (laughs) but they didn't believe it and they had convinced a lot of us this is what this is still going on Doug it's still going on they convinced a lot of African people you can't do this but there were times when they couldn't black people couldn't be quarterbacks of of professional teams couldn't be pitchers because they all believed that these were intellectual things that only white people could do you see and Mm -hmm. they had us believe in that now the the whole the thing the whole wall is broken down, mm-hmm. and black people are demonstrating and fighting and doing things that are incredibly brilliant. And Fannie Willis in Georgia, you see, and the sister in New York, all of these things now coming together that this in this this intelligence, this will, this self reliance. I mean, no, we we. It, and it, it is a it's an inter, it's an interesting time. I think there's more to come, and okay. I'm just really happy that you're doing this for Buffalo. Absolutely, and I'm just really wonderful. I want you to please keep in touch with me. Absolutely, and me, uh, uh, be in touch with the Buffalo people that I love so much, mm-hmm. and they made so much uh, uh, significance to me and my history and my career. And before I let you go, your just tell us one more time about the the new book that you have coming out. Yes, the new book is called, well, there are a couple of new books. One, I'm writing about Buffalo, and I'm writing a history of the Black Studies field. But that's not coming out yet. But what is coming out now is the History of Africa, the fourth edition by Malife Kate Asante. You can probably order it on Amazon right now. All right? Thank you so much, Brother Doug. And thank you so much for your time. Okay. God bless. God bless you.